So, <clears throat> good morning, and again, welcome to FICO World. Um, the title, Dynamic um, Decisions, Conquering Complexity, Competition, and Criminals, actually alluded to this yesterday. We talked a lot about um, making effective decisions, and because of the cybersecurity, because of fraud, we need to make them in real time. But what I wanted to do is actually, uh, we're, we're going to go through this uh, at a higher level and talk about the business implications, but what I wanted to do is actually start by celebrating a birthday. And um, how many people know it's uh, Moore's Law's birthday? How many people know what Moore's Law is? Actually, it's the basis for all the uh, great devices that we carry around. Actually, the first version of Moore's Law was um, every 18 months, the processing uh, power actually doubles, and then it was modified to two years. And more lately, it's moving out because of physics. But fundamentally, the first Intel processor had 2,300 transistors. A transistor is nothing more than an electrical gate. It closes, it opens, and if you want to let some intermediary signal through, you open the gate just partially. But 2,300 transistors. In 2014, Intel released the Xeon processor. It had five billion transistors in it, five billion transistors. And their latest Intel chip, uh, Skylake, they didn't release the number of transistors in it. But what they did say was by the year 2025, so nine years from now, they'll have a chip with 100 billion transistors at three billion hertz. Now contrast that. The reason that's important is because our brains have 100 billion neurons and we operate at 1,000 hertz. So what Intel are saying is they're going to have a chip that's as powerful as our brains but operating at 3 million times the speed. So tremendous, if you think about it, innovation has driven many devices, has driven many services. Gilder's law is just as important is probably less well known in the audience, but what Gilder's Law says is that every year, the bandwidth of a communication network triples. And what that means is the amount of data that flows through your network is three times the capacity it was a year earlier. Think about it, you're now able to pump data, information three times faster every year. The last law, Metcalf's a little bit esoteric, uh, Metcalf was actually the founder of 3Com and the founder of uh, Ethernet. And what this says is the power of a network is actually proportional to the square of the number of nodes on the network. And this is the dream of a marketeer because if you can get a network effect, it just builds and builds the sales. And actually, this is the reason why Facebook uh, market capitalization, Twitter's market capitalization, Google's, is so high. So these three laws have actually driven tremendous innovation. What does that innovation look like? It looks like all these great devices that we're carrying around, which, is, which have got cameras where we can actually FaceTime with our family and our friends, where we've got more apps than we know what to do with. But it's also driven tremendous services. What kind of services? Well, I no longer have to get out of my armchair if I want to listen to music or download music or any music. I've got access to literally tens of thousands of songs. I've also got access to tens of thousands of movies. If I want to sit in the armchair and I want some goods, some clothing, I can go on Amazon and I can download, or sorry, request that that goods be sold to me. And something I frequently do when I get home from work at night is I get Instacart and have them deliver groceries or meal. So we've saved tremendous time because of these services. The ways, ways I use when I'm coming back from golf and I'm doing 80 miles an hour and I want to know if there's a cop somewhere down the street. So as consumers, all these services, from these technology advancements, we've got all these great consumer services the in theory should save us a tremendous amount of time. Now, Will talked about the startups. Now, I was the CEO of a small startup, and I had to build my own mini little data center to get my team up and running and develop the software that we're developing. 
But that's not the case today. Today you sign on to Amazon Web Services and you just start developing. And you've got all these capabilities and you can turn around an app in no time at all. You can use the services that are actually on Amazon or on Azure, and there's many. Our cloud, the FICO Analytic Cloud, actually uses two cloud services that sit on Amazon Web Services. So what's the point? The point is that we've had this technological uh, revolution for 50 years, and we've got all these great devices, we've got all these great services that should have made us more productive. But guess what? It didn't. You're probably looking at this chart thinking, oh, 3% to 1.2%, that's nothing. This is actually the productivity crisis. So if you didn't know there was a producti productivity crisis, there certainly is. And these numbers are not just US specific, they're actually global. So when I saw these, the first thing I thought of was, okay, so what does it mean to me? So what it means is 40 years ago, when you had your son or your daughter, they were going to enjoy a standard of living that was twice as good as yours. But today, that's not the case. Today, it's going to take three generations before they enjoy a double of the standard of living. Now, this is a quote from Paul Krugman. He won the Nobel Prize in uh, economics in 2008. And the comment says everything. Productivity isn't everything, but in the long run, it's almost everything. If we want to improve our standard of living, we've basically got to raise the output per worker. So what does that mean? It's basically pretty simple. We're either going to have to work longer hours and work harder, or we've got to work smarter. The UK got a little blip in its productivity by actually doing the former, in other words, working hard, working long hours. But fundamentally, that's not sustainable. So the obvious question is, if we have this productivity crisis, what's at the basis of it? And it's complexity. So those people who said IT complexity was the big problem for them, I run the IT organization for FICO, and it's certainly a headache for me. It certainly has been for the last couple of years. So what is it? that is making our lives and our business processes so complex? Well, actually, the very technology that we loved and that we enjoy at home is actually a big part of the problem. We all mentioned regulations. In the first quarter of 16, there was another 69 regulations introduced. And as you heard yesterday at the product launch, and I'll touch on again, we've got ever-increasing worries around security and fraud. And then lastly, competition. We'll again touch on competition, but it's not just local competition, it's global competition. Now, the list is obviously much longer than this. I could have touched on organizational hierarchy. I could have touched on cu cultural differences. The list goes on, but fundamentally, the reason for a productivity crisis is exactly this. It's rooted in complexity. So let's just take a quick look at uh, IT. And I'm sure most of you who actually are CIOs or run IT organizers can, can relate to this uh, statistic. In other words, when we get our budget, the majority of it goes on keeping legacy systems going and then maybe just slightly improving them. And we're left with only 16% of the IT budget to actually invest in new projects. That's a problem. That's a problem if you've got a lot of competition. What's worse is that the projects that we used to do, because of complexity, and remember, if you do another project, you've just add, added to that legacy backlog. It's gone from eight and a half months, nine months, to 10 months. So you've added another month to the average time of a, a project. Big data. My, my favorite thing was I attended a customer meeting uh, in London, and it's not the only customer meeting, where there's this big push to build a data lake. For those who don't know what a data lake is, it's the aggregation of disparate data. You leave the data in its existing form with the metadata that comes with it, and then you can work on it to gain insights. But the fact of the matter is, most big data projects fail. They fail because they started without any business intent, without any 
this is what we want from this project. They also fail because of management, believe it or not. Management get the results and then they use their gut and say, this is the decision I'm going to make rather than make it data-based or data, use the data. And then the last reason is you get these insights and you can't actually put them into operation. So these are the, the uh, reasons that it's failed. The biggest failure, data project failure, the National Health Service in the UK. They wasted $10 billion on their big data project. They drowned in their own data lake. Okay, c complexity. I touched on this at the last um, uh, FICO world. Complexity due to regulations. And it's not just the regulations that continually uh, keep coming, it's actually the cost of not being compliant. And these are uh, some of the fines, but it's not just the fines, as I mentioned last FICO world, it's actually the legal fees which far exceed, they're actually orders of magnitude more than the fines themselves. And by the way, financial services is not the most regulated. Actually, there's three industries that are more regulated than fin financial services. So regulations impact most industries. And then there's a criminal element. Again, coming back to the CIOs in the audience, I don't know about you, but one of the, the dreads that I've got is we're breached. And so will the executive board, we spend a lot of time, a lot of money, have a significant staff working on improving our security status. And we bring in consultants to come in and advise us what we do. And we're always investing in the latest technology in this area. So, you know, tremendous investment. And again, it brings complexity. One of the issues we had was, um, you know, we, we, we're a software culture and the engineers need access to the machines and yet you need to shut that access down. And so there's the, the complexity that arrives with a lack of freedom from the developers doing the job that they need to do. And then competition. Competition's a complexity all in of itself. Actually, I quickly looked this morning at uh, the number of uh, fintech startups and, and the amount of money that was invested. And when I presented these numbers, you know, not just six months ago, um, it was like 750 fintechs, and I forget, it was like um, $11 billion. And this morning, it was over 1,000 fintechs, $16 billion. So tremendous competition. And the thing is, they, they're nipping at your heels. And they're global, they're not just US based. And Jamie Dimon's favorite quote to his, maybe not his favorite quote, but a quote that's pretty famous is, watch for Silicon Valley. He sees them as competition. But it's not just financial services. It's actually pretty much all the industries, whether it be telecommunications, transportation, energy, entertainment. We're all suffering from, you know, heightened competition. So, for those people who enjoy management books, and I must admit, most of my career I've enjoyed management books, there was a great book called Built to Last by Jim Collins. Anybody remember that book? And then, so that was 1996. And then in 2001, he wrote a book called Good to Great. And then in 2011, he was writing about the death of many of the companies. Right? And actually, this is what this shows. Because of competition, that your tenure in the S&P 500 is a lot shorter. Okay, so you can't take anything for granted. So what do you do about it? You've got all this complexity, what do you do about it? So, I love this. You know what this is? This is called abstraction. This is uh, Malcolm McLean. He was an American, by the way. That's a good Scottish name. And what he did was, he owned a trucking company. And the reason he used this example was because it was in 1956, the same time as uh, FICO was born. What he did was, he looked at the, the packing of his trucks and the unpacking of his trucks. And it just took forever. And there was breakage and there was theft, and he said, there's got to be a better way. 
And so he actually invented the container. Now here's a great statistic for you. It was estimated that it takes $5.86 per ton to fill a ship. It takes 16 cents to fill a container. That's changing the game, right? That's changing the game. So what's the thesis? The, th the thesis is doing it a different way, if it's the right way, is certainly going to make a huge difference. Standardization is going to make a huge difference. By, by the way, there's, there was an afterplay. Turns out, uh, a little known fact, New York and San Francisco used to be the ports of entry for unloading goods. And because of containerization, there was no space left. And so they moved to New Jersey and they moved to Oakland for unloading. But this, this invention, by the way, he did a couple of other very smart things. He gave away his patent. And secondly, the US military standardized on containers. And today, actually in 2008, 90% of all non-bulk goods are shipped worldwide through these containers. So there's a great story of the value proposition that the containers provided. It just spread like wildfire. So we at FICO decided to do it a different way. And actually, we, we went through these different um, initiatives that made up the Decision Management Platform 2.0. And they're actually incredibly simple to understand. The first was, we make decisions every day, 3,400 every day. But the big decisions that we make, we seldom codify them, seldom capture them. In fact, if you look at the institutional knowledge in an enterprise, it's basically the quarterly financial statements. And if you really are disciplined, you might use a product lifecycle management solution. But fundamentally, most of us and enterprises today don't capture the decision. So the first concept is, let's just write down the decision. The second concept is, I've got to be competitive, and I've got to develop a solution rapidly. Let's, go, let's develop a stack that takes a different approach to developing solutions rapidly. The third concept is, I built the solution. Every time I want to do something different, I don't want to rewrite the solution. I just want to change some business terms and have that propagate through to oper operationalization. That was tough. And then I took the trouble to write all, to have my team work and develop these decisions. So I want to store them. And I want to store them in the form that the decision was codified in. And then the last concept for decision management 2.0 was all around there's a wonder of analytics. There's a wonder of geniuses who come up with analytic techniques. But the majority of us can't use those techniques. And when we use them, we need incredible scalability. So I'll tell you what, why don't we collaborate? And again, through the, if you get nothing out of this presentation, collaboration is everything. And there's a great TED talk you're going to hear from Dan, Dan Early, who's a marvelous speaker, uh, who's given many TED talks. Yves Moreau gave a presentation on the productivity crisis. The thesis was the reason there is a productivity crisis is complexity, and the solution out of the problem is through collaboration. So if you, if you are fans of TED Talk, go see it. Anyway, five very simple concepts, but five very powerful concepts. So Will used to work for Jack Welsh, and you know, as a uh, business student, I'm a great fan of, of Jack Welsh's as well. And this is one of the, um, I think, a, a very powerful statement, which is your ability to learn and then translate that learning into action rapidly is the ultimate competitive advantage. I don't know about you, but that makes a lot of sense to me. So the obvious question is, how do you do that? And so we talked about this concept of capturing and codifying information. So why do I think it's so powerful? Let, let's just talk about cyber breaches for a second. If your data center is breached, what do you do? Well, if you know in real time, you're just going to close the whole data center down, but you also close your entire business down. And if you've actually got customers running their business in, in your data centers, you're closing their business down, their businesses down too. So 
Using decision model notation, what you can do is you can codify the breach practices. You can make a decision to close down a breached port. You can make a decision to close down an exposed database. And it's not every database in the DSN, and it's not every port. It's those ports that are impacted. The other example I'll give is expenses, say expense reporting. Every company has expense reporting. And they'll have rules associated with travel, travel business class, travel economy, premium economy. They'll have decisions to make around alcohol. They'll have decisions around how much money you can spend daily. Each one of these is a decision. And if you codify these decisions for one company, you can then take them to the next company, and you can extend them, and you can change them. Now, I used to be a systems engineer, and my first job when I, was in, uh, when I came to California was working for Kaiser Electronics. Kaiser Electronics make a head, head up and head down displays. So if you've seen um, Tom Cruise's movie, Top Gun, He's wearing a helmet, and he turns his head, sees this MIG, and he puts this cross here to send a sidewinder out. That's what we used to do. When you submit the specifications for a design, you use what's called structured analysis, structured design. And so I worked on doing these basically data flow diagrams, state transition diagrams. And what we always found is when we actually followed that process, developing the software was much more rapid. In other words, if you spent time on the requirements up front, the implementation was just much more rapid. That's what this gives you. But what we've done in the decision management suite is when you've defined your decision, it can be executed without having IT involved or developer, a developer involved. That's the power of DMN. Second comment on this is, I talked about these data lakes, okay? So you pull all these data lakes together, you spend a fortune with some storage provider, then you've got to figure out what to do. But think about it if you took the other approach. Think about it if you said, this is the decision I want to make. What is the data I need and what's the business knowledge I need to make that decision? And by the way, this is a standard. And once you've defined the decision, you can then challenge it you can improve it, and then you can ultimately optimize it. That's why this technology is so powerful. This is MedScheme. This is a, a, a South African. Um, they basically do healthcare uh, service administration, so all the insurers in South Africa um, and also neighboring states actually work with them. And what we did for them was, uh, what they were trying to do was improve the overall process, uh, their process, improve the business process, so they could be more productive, more efficient, and implement a, a more meaningful uh, system. And so what we did was a DRAW session. DRAW stands for Decision Requirements Analysis Workshop. And what that means is we brought the med scheme people we brought the insurers together, we brought the, the hospitals together, we brought patients together, and we worked through what it would take to build a decision process that would, that would then go out to RFP for implementation. And when we were done, even although we had all these people, even although you know, there's basically tens of thousands of rules, millions of records, you basically can see the entire decision process on one page. And then you scope it from there. So again, incredibly powerful process. And um, if we can all embrace it, we'll go a long way to taking a lot of the complexity out of our lives. Now, the second tenant for the decision management suite I talked about was um, intelligent solution creation. And I've talked about rapid application development. So if you have not used rapid application development tools, they're a seat change. I used to be a Java developer, before that a C developer, before that a Fortran developer. This is entirely different development. You're working at abstract level. You can work as a team as an abstract level. It generates the code automatically. You're designing visually, and it manages all the configuration. It manages the integration process for you. It's just, you know, it's a click to integrate with an Oracle database, for example. But the real power comes from being able to do development with your business user. 
And it was mentioned by Dave Lightfoot that we developed our origination solution in conjunction, we developed origination solution in conjunction with customers. And so the customer will give us feedback and we can actually extend the origination solution to, to be custom for that um, customer. Now, here's the thing, that same abstraction and speed of development that you get, got from the original development, you actually get when you subsequently extend the product. Okay, so if you haven't used rapid application development, it's a seed change, you should. For the originations product, um, our original estimates was uh, 20 months, 26 people. We actually did it in seven months with half the number of people. It really works. Now, we of course added our own analytics and decision and capability through the decision management platform. We also added visualization to give us that initial intelligent solution creation offer. So what's the results? Now, I'm an engineer. And so I chose to do this as a graph because I think it's fairly easy. Traditional development, the, the numbers pre-DMS, these were the numbers I was given by my own development team for, for developing the origination solution. And many of the examples, Sprint Customer Onboarding, Vantif, Infosystema, they were, we, we basically played the video, so I'm not going to go through them. But the point is, as we've added capabilities in the decision management suite, we're able to get the time to solution further and further down. And with Strategy Director, we're able to do sophisticated solutions and it only takes eight weeks to do the configuration package. So again, why should you care? Why is it important? Because you can do a tremendous lot, lot more with less than you could through traditional development. It takes a lot of the complexity, gets you to time to value a lot quicker. Okay, so I mentioned that once you've actually built the solution, what you want to do then is provide your business users with the ability to change the solution and get it operationalized almost instantaneously with the press of a button. But the Decision Management Suite also offers you another great facility. In other words, you might not have the right decision process. You might not have the right analytics. And so what you might want to do is you might, might want to do a learning loop. You might want to just do a challenge, champion challenger, change some of the parameters and see what it gives you. And then you keep doing that till you get the resu results you want and then optimize from there. So the faster insight to execution is all around providing business power through either decision trees, decision tables, or some other business metaphor just simple business rules so that you can push them to production. Again, really powerful way to get the exact solution that you want in play. I actually love this uh, story. When I first saw this slide, this was done by Joshua, I thought, oh, terrible slide. But actually, it's a great story. So it turns out in, in Tanzania, in Tangara uh, National Park, there's basically three herds of elements. And in 1993, there was a drought. And it turns out there's about 81 elephants in the uh, three herds. And there was 16 of them died, 16 um, calves died. In non-drought times, so that's 20%, by the way. In non-drought times, only 2% die. It turns out when these elephants were studied, two of the herds, sorry, two of the, the groups actually had better survival rates than the one who stayed on the, 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 within the park. The other two actually left the park looking for food and water. And so the re researchers asked the question, why? And it turns out the reason that the two groups that left survived is because they had matriarchs that were older than 35 years old. In other words, they had seen the drought in 1961, 62, and so their institutional memory saved the calves of the herd. So actually, it's a great story. And that's actually an incredibly simple concept if you think about it. So you've taken the decision models, you've taken that subject matter expertise from your um, best and brightest. You want to store it. You want to manage it, you want to challenge it, you want to optimize it. Now, originally, 
This concept came from Model Central. It was a product that I talked about. Um, we developed it in conjunction with uh, JP Morgan Chase, and we presented that case study at Lights FICO World. But it became obvious as we built out the decision management suite that as we developed greater and greater decision assets, DMN models, decision trees, decision tables, different types of analytic techniques, configuration packages, it just makes perfect sense to store those decision assets. And you need to store them with the data, right? Again, I come back to how every set of data that you have, there was a decision that was used to generate the data. And so if you store both the decisions that were used to generate the data, not together physically, but if you store them both virtually, then you can do what-if scenarios on the decisions that you made. When people leave, you've codified the decisions, and so you're not as exposed. And so a very simple concept, but a very powerful concept nonetheless. ANZA, um, have, they've got 170 uh, models. Again, um, it, sounds, it sounds a lot. It is a lot for ANZA. But they've got tremendous benefit through using Model Central to basically track the models, to you know, make sure that they're not de degrading, understand who's, who created the models with what attributes, et cetera. So tremendous benefit. But just think about the DMNs. We make, again, 3,400. The number of DMN models your enterprise is likely to generate is going to be in the thousands, not the hundreds. So again, I mentioned a big theme of this presentation and of what we're doing at FICO. Collaboration is key. The thing about, the, the, and maybe Dan will talk about it, the thing about doing these decision models is the team's working together. You can actually see the decision coming together. You can see what data is being used. You can see what business knowledge is being used. The team's collaborating. They're seeing the fruits of the labor come to life. And that's, for human beings, a, a really um, strong, gives you a real strong impulse to keep working harder, to keep contributing. So it was pretty clear to me and to my team that it doesn't matter how good FICO is at developing analytics, there's always better analytics from someone else at a particular time. And so we develop our analytics. We embrace analytics from standards, from PMML, from SAS, from R, but also from the machine learning uh, capabilities that's now Spark. Spark, as Dave Lightfoot said yesterday, is the biggest open source um, project ever. And the benefit is that you not only get this participation in developing the machine learning algorithms, but you also have a platform with incredible scalability. And so if you think about it, the, the decision management suite coupled with Spark, you've got the best of man and the best of machine bringing them together. So just to um, summarize, if you want to beat complexity, you need a different model, right? So rather than the, the, the string lift, it's a containerized model. Decision management suite, the way to think about it is like a containerized model. This is really simple. I capture um, subject matter expertise. I've got a very rapid way to develop solutions. When I've got my solution, I can then make informed what if loops. I can do, you know, basically learn loops. I can optimize. I'm going to store the decisions, put the decisions back into my uh, solution, see how they do over time. And then I've got powerful analytics that I can add depending on what the solution is. That's what the Decision Management Suite 2.0 is. I think we're going to play a video. Could we have the video now, please? Part of the airline's thought process has always been to push for efficiency, to make the best use of our people and their time and our resources.
Our mission at Southwest Airlines is to connect people to the important things in their life. The FICO Express Optimization Suite underlies some of the biggest, most expensive problems that we solve at the airline. There are so many opportunities for optimization. We've been able to break into crew planning, uh, flight planning, fuel purchasing, gate assignment, ground ops assignment, provisioning the aircraft with beer and peanuts. I mean, there's, there's so much to do. The FICO Express Optimization Suite is certainly enabling more growth at the company. Uh, it's also enabling us to look at, at new areas uh, within the company that uh, optimization would really help. Later this year, we're going to be putting optimized gate assignment into production so that in the future, we look at how far our passengers and our crew have to walk within the terminal, while at the same time making sure uh, gates are available for planes that happen to arrive early, or maybe the ones that are there a little bit later uh, taking off so that they're not blocking anything else. Historically, Southwest has never really um, used optimization to cut costs for staff. What we view it as is, is freeing up our employees to focus on more interesting problems um, in more productive ways. We've been using Express, and it's just a fantastic product. Even more, the partnership that we were able to create with, uh, with FICO just really won the day. So he said something really important. He said, I want to optimize because I want to free my staff up to do something more important. And that's actually exactly what this session is all about. The criminals, they're getting bolder. They're getting more innovative. Their organizations, they're global. And what's worse is they attack us from protected harbors. That great technology that I talked about, Moore's Law, Gilder's Law, Metcalf's Law, us building data lakes, it's the perfect storm. Actually, we're centralizing all our data in these data lakes so they can come and get it. We're doing them a favor. So we've got to work a lot more smarter. We've got to use different technology. I don't know how many people saw the Bangladesh heist. How many people saw this? Okay, so let me just uh, explain it. This is um, a really interesting story. Basically, the uh, Central Bank of Bangladesh held um, a very large sum of money in the New York uh, Federal Reserve in uh, New York. And basically what happened is in May, so this incident happened, this incident, this attack happened in February and in May, a year earlier, malware was used uh, within the Bangladesh bank. And it was used to compromise the SWIFT network. And basically, they were able to get the, the SWIFT credentials that would allow the hackers to then do initiations posing as the Bangladesh bank. If you look at the sums of money we're talking about, it's a billion dollars. Now, this isn't small time crime. This would have been if they got away with it, the second biggest crime ever. And but for some fortuitous mistakes, they would have got away with it all. But fundamentally, it's a, a, a really interesting story because it's, it's basically cyber crime followed by fraud, followed by money laundering. They actually, the way this works is, because of a number of spelling mistakes, because of a transaction that was too uh, large, that was the 20 million to Sri Lanka, it basically tipped off the banks that they should stop further transactions. So of the 35, only five went through, worth 101 million. Now, they're really smart people, but they need to take some English lessons because they misspelled foundation and spelt it foundation. They were fans of themselves. And so that 20 million was recovered. But the other 81 million, and by the way, this went to Rizal uh, Bank, um, and the branch manager had basically opened up four uh, dummy accounts, put the money into the accounts, 
and then that money made its way into casinos and then um, became untraceable. So really big, audacious crime. And as I said, it's fraud, it's cybersecurity, it's fraud, and then money laundering. But guess what? It doesn't stop there. This was a story yesterday. While we were watching the product launch, basically um, Reuters uh, sent out the story saying uh, all 11,000 financial institutions are now compromised. It was because it wasn't the first cyber attack. They just cyber attacks hadn't been reported. So we've got a huge problem because this is our internet economy. This is the very good services that we all buy over the internet, and so now we have a real problem. So what are we going to do about it? Well, this is what Gartner's view is. Basically, what Gartner says is you need advanced analytics, and you need advanced analytics that responds in real time. Well, thankfully, we've got that. It's called Falcon. And actually, we've been developing analytics around Falcon in conjunction with our customers for more than a decade now. In fact, it's a couple of decades. And as a result of that cooperation, that collaboration, we've actually managed to reduce fraud 70%. And so that's a tremendous achievement for all of us. So we've been doing this for 25 years. We, we develop 100 models and we distri distribute to them, you to them. We distribute them to you every year. And we manage 2.6 billion accounts. It's 9,000 9, banks. That's 68% of uh, credit cards. And so because of that consortium collaboration, nothing else, that consortium collaboration, we're actually able to work together and protect one another. And so that collaboration is really important to us. And hopefully it's important to you. Now, you can't rest on your laurels because what works for card fraud doesn't necessarily work for mobile devices. And the fact that we've um, all got mobile devices and the chances are that our, our, maybe not the banks, but enterprises don't treat iPads and mobile phones with the same security diligence as they do um, the traditional channels, we need to do something more. And so we've, uh, we've innovated in the area of biometrics because it turns out your phone can take your fingerprint, it can take your voice print, it can take your face print. By the way, there's a gyro in there, and so it can identify you, your movements. And then your usage of your phone, who you call, the apps you use, the way you use your apps, they're all fingerprints. And so we've got an opportunity to use that technology together to, again, protect a really important channel. But I want to come back to um, general collaboration. It turns out I was visiting a large customer and the large customer said, well, I've got a fraud solution, and I've got a money laundering, anti-money laundering solution, and I've got all the IT headaches associated with administering both systems. And by the way, there's no cooperative information goes from one to the other. And so 71% of CROs actually said, we want a combined system. And actually, as a result of this and the feedback from our customers, we bought Tom Beller. And our long-term goal is to progressively integrate our Falcon platform in an anti-money laundering solution. But I thought I would come back to why it's really important to collaborate. This is HSBC. Um, they were fined $1.9 billion in um, uh, 2011, I think it was, 2011. And as a result, they've been steadily increasing the staff and increasing the investment in their compliance. These are staggering numbers. Their annual profits are $13 billion. And so they're spending just under 24% of their, their margin on compliance. And remember that comment around, I want to move my people onto something that's more productive? They've got 9,000 employees that I'm sure could make a, a better contribution than just looking after uh, compliance. They need to automate. We need to work together to automate. Now, anti-money laundering has a very negative side to humanity as well. It turns out every two minutes, there's a new child pushed into sex trafficking. And we all watch the terrorist attacks and um, you know, the funding of drugs. 
So real problem. So what's, what's the answer? The answer obviously is advanced analytics. We, yes, we're going to put case management to make it more pr productive to deal with the cases that do come up. But it also, I think it's about us collaborating. If we're going to do something about money laundering, we're going to do it quickly. We need to aggregate all the learnings associated with money laundering. And if we do that, we work together, we collaborate, we fight crime together, and we stop terrorist funding, we stop their travel, we stop them buying weapons, and we stop them attacking us. Now, Will mentioned that cybersecurity is a bigger problem. So it's not fraud, it's not money laundering, it's cybersecurity. And Doug Clare showed this slide yesterday. The amount of, of attacks, the size of the attacks, the one that staggers me here is, and the, the, it's the bottom one that affects me, because it's, I, I get, I mean, I'm sure you get all these alerts that you've got to go do something about, but the one that staggers me is 84 million new malware samples in 2015, that's staggering. So what's, what's the answer? We feel it's working together, it's collaboration. Because unless we work together, using a model like Falcon, we won't be able to develop the techniques. We won't be able to spend fast enough to stop the cyber breaches. Again, coming back to what's the answer? The answer is advanced analytics in real time, and we develop them in conjunction with you. Now, Will mentioned it, and Doug mentioned it. The reason I put this slide up here is because partnerships are critical. They're critical not just to developing advanced solutions like the one we've done with iBoss, but they're also really important in terms of what I'm going to talk next. Because at FICO, because of the type of work we do, I get 300 plus audits a year. But if you think about it, if we're breached, you need breach underwriting insurance. We also have to evaluate our vendors in terms of their security status. And then we've got to talk to our boards and talk to the, the executive teams about what we're doing. So wouldn't it be just great if there was a risk assessment tool, one that was out there? And the fact of the matter is, there are some, but they just don't do the job. And so, what we're announcing today is FICO is going to develop a cybersecurity score, much like a credit score. And we're going to work with industry partners, insurers, the regulators, software vendors, and enterprises to build this out. And the reason that it's so important for us all is because if we don't do something like this, if we don't work to improve the score, and the underlying technologies around it, we're all going to do our own thing, and we're, we're back to HSBC. We're all going to be spending the $3 billion each. So we're just going to waste money, we're never going to catch up, we're going to waste human capital, and we're going to be behind. So what we're working on is, for fraud, security, and compliance, building out our analytics, but more importantly, collaborating with our customers and with government agencies and with other vendors to provide a, a more holistic solution to all three problems. So I'm going to end with um, what I think is critical to get back the productivity that we're losing. And so my thesis is collaborative decision science, advanced analytics, and we'll start to be more productive and grow. With that, thank you.